Howdy and welcome to the 10-week Bible study. This is week two, day two of our study of Galatians and Colossians. I'm your host, Darren Hibbs, and today we're talking about Galatians 2, 6 through 10. Well, welcome back to the 10-week Bible study. Again, I'm your host, Darren Hibbs. Would you join me as we pray before we start? Lord, would you open our eyes and our ears to hear what your word has to say to us, God. Speak to us and fill our hearts with the knowledge of you. We want to encounter you in your word today. In Jesus' name, amen. With that, let's jump into God's word. I'll be reading today from the NIV. This is Galatians 2, starting in verse 6. As for those who were held in high esteem, whatever they were makes no difference to me. God does not show favoritism. They added nothing to my message. All right, so pause right there. Going back to yesterday and several and last week, Paul is talking about uh, how he refused to go to the apostles in Jerusalem after the Lord called him, after the Lord arrested his attention and flipped his life upside down from being the Christian persecutor to being a Christian evangelist. <clears throat> Paul didn't go to Jerusalem. He didn't want to exchange his former life of doing everything in his power to try and appeal to and impress the Pharisees and Sadducees, well, not, probably not the Sadducees, but the Pharisees and all of the religious leaders, he didn't want to exchange that for trying to impress the disciples and the apostles in Jerusalem. And so he just stayed away. And again, it's not because he was mad at them, he didn't like them, or he had a disagreement with them. It's because he didn't want to get sucked back into that lifestyle. And so he didn't go. And he's like, and they're held in high esteem. And I, I don't think that Paul is saying here that they shouldn't be held in high esteem. They should be held in high esteem. Even to this day, we should hold the apostles of the Lamb in high esteem. But he, he said, whatever they were doesn't make any difference to me. God doesn't show favoritism, right? He does not show favoritism. Not to you, not to me, not even to Peter. Not to anyone. He does not show favoritism favoritism. There is nothing that they have that you and I don't have that God, I mean, you know, innate in our nature that God would be like, oh, I like this person more than the other. He doesn't show favoritism. We are all on this same plane. We are all sinners who have been saved by the blood of Jesus. Verse seven, on the contrary, they recognize that I've been entrusted with the task of preaching the gospel to the uncircumcised, just as Peter had been to the circumcised. So at this point, Paul is, uh, this is again, plus 14 years on from his conversion. Paul is um, explaining that, you know, I had been sent to the Gentiles and, and, this isn't really found anywhere in the book of Acts, but Peter apparently must have felt that he was, I guess, the primary evangelist cause, called to go to the Jews, wherever they were. And so Peter is focusing on bringing Jewish people to faith, and Paul is focused on bringing Gentiles to faith. Now, as far as the other 11 apostles in, in, in Jerusalem and after, the, after they spread out, uh, who knows exactly what they felt like their main calling was. But here we find out that Peter feels like he is called specifically to go and find Jews and, and bring them to Jesus. Paul is going to Gentiles. And it's interesting, you know, that even Paul, all the places that he went, we know in the book of Acts, everywhere he went, the first place he always went to was to the Jews. He always went to the synagogue first. And he was with possibly one minor exception, he was always rejected and run out of the synagogue by the Jewish leadership in every town that he went to. And he always went to the Gentiles immediately afterward, but he always started with the Jews. And so, um, you know, it's, it's a, a very interesting thing, you know, the, the, the way that Paul did this is like, well, I'm called to the Gentiles, but he still goes to the Jews first anyway, but knowing that they're probably going to reject him. <clears throat> going back to yesterday's passage, Paul had gone to them because he didn't want to, he, he wanted to make sure, I've been doing this for a while now, and I want to make sure that I'm not teaching the wrong things. And so he's been teaching the gospel as he understands, as the Lord presented it to him and revealed to him over time. 
And he goes to the apostles in Jerusalem now after 14 plus years to say, hey, this is what I'm teaching. If you all have a problem with it, am I doing this wrong? Correct me if I need it. Because I don't want to find out that I've been doing all of this in vain. And so after some bit of time, he's like, actually, okay, so now I've broken the, the, the grip of seeking man's approval, broken that. It's probably time to go and have a discussion with them now because I am making some rounds here and I should probably touch base. And so he does that. But still, he's even saying like, even then, it doesn't matter necessarily because God doesn't show favoritism. He doesn't show favoritism, no matter what. And it doesn't matter how rich you are, how many people, people you're leading in your church or how many people are in your company or how many people you've led to the Lord, all of that stuff, that doesn't matter when it comes to, you know, how the Lord views us. Now, again, there's a difference between all of that. And and, I mean, the Lord rewards us in eternity. He really does. And he he said, I'll reward you for um, even a cup of cold water, a little cup of cold water to someone in need. The Lord remembers that. So I don't want to take anything away from that. But as far as, you know, am I like more revered by God than other people because, you know, I am something or people look up to me? No, what other people think of me doesn't matter to God. Now, does that mean that that um, God doesn't hold people in high esteem? No, that doesn't mean that God doesn't hold people in high esteem. He comes to Daniel and he says, you know, the angel, when he comes to Daniel, is like, you who are highly esteemed, right, by God. That's that's the the point there. And so Daniel was highly esteemed by men. He was a ruler in 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 Babylon and then Persia, but he's also highly esteemed by God. But the two are not necessarily equated. Can you be highly esteemed by men and highly esteemed by God? Yes. Daniel, David, we have examples of those in scripture. Can you be highly esteemed by God while not highly esteemed by men? Yes. The the widow who comes and, and brings her widow's might, the two little copper coins that she puts in is all she has. Jesus himself says, this woman is highly esteemed, right? She is like, I like this, right? But nobody on planet earth is going to be like, hey, Lady, we want to hear what you have to say um, because you just gave the smallest offering we've ever seen. So we want to hear from you the depths of your wisdom from God. And that's never going to happen on this earth. But she was highly esteemed by God. Can you be highly esteemed by men and not highly esteemed by God? Absolutely. (laughs) Absolutely. There's probably too many examples to cite for that. But the, the important thing here is what other people think of you has like, it's not like, hey, I, I'm not going to show up on the day of judgment, stand before the Lord and say, hey, God, a lot of people thought a lot of me. Like I was held in high esteem by a lot of people. And God's going to say, so are, are they here standing judgment over you? Do they have any say in this moment? And the answer is no. And so what other people think of you, whether they're highly esteemed on earth, it doesn't matter before God. That's why we need, it can be so easy to get sucked into this man-pleasing environment where we're always doing things to, to make other people happy. When we need to focus on what is it that the Lord wants of me? Because that's the, the thing that I want to do because I want to make him happy. And again, it's not where I need to do stuff to make the God make God like me so he'll save me. It's that I've already been saved and now that I understand what I've been saved from and what I've been offering in exchange, nothing else makes sense but to lay everything at his feet and give him everything of me. And so two very different paradigms. How do we live for God and not for the approval of man? Verse 8. For God, who is at work in Peter as an apostle to the circumcised, was also at work in me as an apostle to the Gentiles. James, Cephas, and John, those esteemed as pillars, gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship when they recognized the grace given to me. They agreed that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. All they asked was that we should continue to remember the poor, the very thing I had been eager to do all along. 
And so, you know, here it's saying, you know, Peter, Peter is Cephas. Um, there, he's saying that these guys, they're going to the circumcised, they're going to the Jewish people and me and my posse here, we're going to the Gentiles and they say, listen, the only thing that we ask of you is that you remember the poor. And Paul's like, hey, that's the, the very thing I'm wanting to do. Jesus, you know, when he gives them kind of the marching instructions in the Gospels, um, this is my very loose paraphrase, but Jesus essentially tells the disciples, when you go into a city and, and you're looking for people to spread the gospel message to, go to the low-hanging fruit. Go to the people who are hurting and broken and weak and poor and needy, right? They are already humbled. They have been humbled by life. It says, you know, God is close to the humble and far from the proud. So he tells them, you know, don't, don't go to the wealthy, go to the poor, go to the needy, go to the hurting, right? But what is the natural inclination of anybody? And this is just so true in, in churches throughout history and especially in our culture today. Who is it that, you know, pastors and leaders and people they want to surround themselves with are the wealthy, the respected. You know, I mean, how many churches, the deacons and the people that they kind of get elevated into those positions of authority and surround the structure of the churches? How often are they doctors, lawyers, politicians, you know, people that we look up to? And again, there's nothing inherently wrong with that, right? You can be esteemed by man and esteemed by God. But how often are our eyes blinded by the esteem of man over the esteem of God? How often do you find churches where the entire leadership structure are people who, you know, aren't from means or aren't people of standing in the community? How often do we see that? And again, it's, it happens. I, I know of some churches where that happens, but that's really rare compared to it being the other way. And so the apostles are, are telling him something that he's already expressing is, I don't want to go after the approval of man. And you don't get any approval of man when you're going to the poor. You don't, like, they don't have anything to offer you. And the wealthy people, they're like, oh, you can have them. You can go do whatever you want to do with them. It doesn't bother me. Uh, I'll go find someone else that wants to, you know, fluff up my ego. And so what Paul is essentially saying here is they're all on the same team. They're all on the same page. And again, I want to come back to the fact that God revealed this to Paul. He's revealed it, you know, face to face. Jesus literally and physically was on earth. He reveals all of this face to face to the apostles. Uh, he appears to Paul and, and gives him revelation along the way. He, he reveals it to Paul, both through revelation and, both the same God at different times and in different ways, but same God, same revelation. And that's the amazing thing. That's why there still is a church. That's why there still are Christians is because no matter what we do, we can't screw up the gospel message so much that the Lord doesn't continue to give revelation and bring it back to truth. People are not the the true bearers of the truth of the gospel. It is the Holy Spirit and he alone. For the 10-Week Bible Study, I'm your host, Aaron Hibbs, and I can't wait to see you next time. Hey, thanks for watching the 10-Week Bible Study. If you've enjoyed this, would you consider doing that whole like and subscribe and bell thing you're always hearing people talk about? It really helps other people find out about the show, and my heart is for people to fall in love with God's word. Thank you. Thank you.